As the frontier pushed farther west with the rapidly growing population of the United States in the 19th century, the white pioneers moving westward encountered not only the Indians displaced earlier from the eastern regions of the country, but also the indigenous Plains Indians, the Apaches, Comanches, Navajo, Cheyenne, and other Indians made famous in western movies and Wild West literature. Many of these Indians were hunters and warriors, who had retained a greater political and cultural independence of the European settlers, and some in the southwest had rebelled against Spanish rule and continued to raid Mexican settlements. Perhaps most important of all, the Plains Indians had been introduced to the horse during the era when what is today the American southwest was part of Mexico, and the horse brought a revolutionary transformation of life on the plains. Tribes once sedentary and agricultural became nomadic in their pursuit of the buffalo, whose hides found a ready market in the white economy, and whose meat supplied the Indians with food. The horse changed hunting techniques from those of tightly controlled large hunting parties on foot to much wider ranging and smaller groups or even individuals who could successfully attack buffalo on horseback over much wider distances. A skilled hunter could kill enough buffalo in a matter of minutes to supply his family for months. The horse also made possible the transport of much heavier loads than had been possible by human porters or by dog-drawn sleds. Accordingly, Indian tents grew larger, now that more building material and household contents could be transported. These wider-ranging forays also brought tribesmen into other tribes' hunting grounds, providing more occasions for warfare. While the horse was the most important of the animals introduced from Europe into the Western Hemisphere, cattle and sheep also became part of the economy and the culture of the Plains Indians. Two centuries before white Americans moved west in massive numbers after the Civil War, cattle and sheep had become familiar to the Indians in the West, largely because the Spaniards had brought these animals to New Spain, which encompassed what is today California and the American Southwest. Thus, cattle were present in this region as early as the 17th century, even though the golden age of American cattle herding was in the last half of the 19th century. The horse, an essential complement for cattle herding, was likewise introduced to the Plains Indians in the 17th century. The horse diffused northward and eastward from the Spanish settlements, the northern Plains Indians getting them much later, perhaps as late as the 18th century. Farther south, however, Spanish records show raiding Apaches carrying off hundreds of horses in 1659. Half a century later, Comanche and Ute Indians raided Apache horses. While Indians could obtain horses through trade with the Spaniards, the latter would not trade guns to the Indians. Meanwhile, the English and the French to the east of the Plains Indians would trade guns. With guns diffusing southward and westward from the British and French colonial settlements in Canada and in the thirteen American colonies, the horse frontier and the gun frontier eventually met in the eighteenth century on the Great Plains, and a new way of life began for the Indians there. The Lewis and Clark expedition was able to buy horses from Indians in 1805, and they commented on the herds of these animals that the Indians possessed at that time. By the time whites began moving into the plains in large numbers in the 19th century, the Indians there had long been mounted warriors with firearms. As of 1860, the Blackfoot Indians had as many horses as people. The geographic setting of the western plains was quite different from that of the eastern United States. There were far fewer navigable rivers in the west, and of course there was no access to the ocean from the plains, so that waterborne transportation played a much smaller economic and military role in this region than in the east. Like other climates in the interior of continents, that on the western plains was more bitterly cold in the winter and more witheringly hot in the summer than climates in coastal areas, where a large adjacent body of water moderated temperatures. While there was fertile land in some places, there were also large regions of desert, semi-desert, and otherwise barren land in the west. Under these conditions, the western Indian population was more thinly spread over vast areas, which might seem to make them more vulnerable to invasion. On the other hand, the distances involved and the scarcity of navigable waterways meant that American military forces in the region often had to be supplied by difficult and expensive overland routes, and in many places could be deployed only by foot or on horseback before the era of railroad building in the mid-19th century.
Here again, however, European diseases preceded the mass movements of whites themselves into the plains. In the quarter century preceding the Civil War, epidemics of smallpox and cholera devastated Indians in the West. Only about half of the Blackfoot Indians survived a smallpox epidemic, and only 100 out of 1,600 Mandans lived through it. Half the Comanches died of cholera, and other tribes were similarly afflicted. While the Plains Indians were weakened in numbers, there were growing numbers of Americans, and the United States government was unchallenged by any other world power in its claim to all the land from the Atlantic to the Pacific between Mexico and Canada. Unlike the Indians in colonial times, the Plains Indians could expect no help from alliances with contending European imperial powers, nor did Americans any longer need the Indians as allies against such powers. The advancing technology of weaponry and transport also shifted the balance of power more toward the Americans militarily. Trains, for example, could carry troops as far in a day as they could march in a month. Moreover, after the Civil War, the American Army had many battle-experienced commanders, of whom Sherman and Custer were the best known, to lead troops in the West. While the odds against the Plains Indians in their resistance to the westward push of whites into their territories were less favorable than in the past, the alternatives were more desperate, for now there was no other land farther west that could be offered to them on which to resettle. They had to fight or submit where they were. Thus the stage was set for the battles that would rage for decades on the western plains until the last battle at Wounded Knee in 1890 marked the end of Indian armed resistance. It was from this era that much of the image of the American Indian and of the American pioneers emerged. The Indian chiefs whose names became famous, Geronimo, Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, were leaders of the fierce, bloody, bitter, but ultimately unavailing resistance. The ferocity and mercilessness of the struggle on both sides generated burning hatreds and hideous acts of revenge and counter-revenge that poisoned relations between whites and Indians for generations. After years of smoldering resentments among Indians in Minnesota over the way they were being cheated and mistreated by federal officials, in 1862 four young Sioux murdered five white settlers on a dare, initiating an outpouring of Indian violence that led to wide-ranging attacks on white farm settlements in which the men were killed and the women and children taken captive, while bands of Indians spread across the countryside, pillaging, raping, and burning. About 400 whites were killed in a day. American military forces struck back, capturing 2,000 Sioux, of whom about 300 were sentenced to hang on the basis of questionable evidence about their individual guilt. After reviewing the trial record, President Lincoln reduced the number to be hanged to 38, over vehement protests from local whites. The Sioux as a whole, however, lost their reservation as a result of these outbreaks and were moved farther west, as were the Winnebagoes, for the local pressure to be rid of all Indians was politically irresistible. In the Southwest, Indian and Hispanic inhabitants of New Mexico had a long history of raids and counter-raids against one another, as well as peaceful trade in between. With the coming of the Civil War and a movement of federal troops out of the region to fight against the Confederates in the East, the Navajos stepped up their raids. However, as the rapidly growing Union Army acquired more troops, new reinforcements arrived in the region and struck back at the Navajos, not only killing many of them, but also destroying their crops and livestock in order to starve them into surrender. Meanwhile, other Indian tribes, such as the Pueblos and Hopis, seized the opportunity to plunder the Navajos, as did local whites. After the Navajos were forced to surrender, they were then moved by the thousands to a new region, where they had inadequate land where their flocks were raided by the Comanches and Kiowas, and where they were barely able to survive on rations issued by the federal government. In Colorado, a massive military response to Cheyenne raids on whites led to a massacre of 200 Indians, including women, children, and even infants, all of whom were scalped and their bodies mutilated. One sign of the animosity existing between the whites and Indians at this point was that these Cheyenne scalps were then exhibited on stage in a Denver theater at intermission, to the applause of the audience. Meanwhile, as the survivors of the massacres reached Indian settlements, reactions among the Cheyenne, Sioux, and Arapaho 
led to Indian attacks on white settlements for months thereafter, the Indians burning ranches, plundering wagon trains, ripping up miles of telegraph wire, scattering cattle herds, and cutting off Denver from the east. Then the Indians melted away, and even massive military expeditions failed to find them in the vast, rugged, and empty lands of the region. While American military forces were able to offer more security to white settlements and travel routes, their long supply lines were not only logistical handicaps, but also betrayed their visible presence to Indians, who could then escape. Not all the Plains Indians fought, and not all the land was conquered. The federal government continued to purchase land at prices below the market level, and some Indians negotiated whatever terms they could, living thereafter on reservations with varying degrees of security from white encroachment. Just as the eastern Indians had hunted beavers and deer to virtual extinction, so the Plains Indians hunted the buffalo to virtual extinction, using the horse and the rifle. In both cases, this left the Indians more dependent on the surrounding white society and economy in general, and on the federal government in particular. 